So of course, uh, one of the big challenges of or organic uh, management is uh, uh, controlling uh, damaging uh, insect pests and, and diseases. And this uh, uh, first harvest season, we've run into a number of different insect pests that have caused damage to our, our raspberries. There's a few specific things that we find in tunnels that maybe aren't such an issue in other plantings. One in particular is, uh, is thrips. We sometimes see thrips problems. We also see mites because it's a drier climate, more like a greenhouse environment. And then we have had issues in here with uh, potato leafhopper, an insect that comes in during the spring and works its way into the tunnels and certain varieties we're finding are quite sensitive to that. Uh, the potato leaf hopper is an interesting insect in Michigan. It's a widespread problem across many perennial crops. What makes it so interesting is that it can't overwinter in Michigan. Um, and what that means is that we don't have an endemic population that stays throughout the winter in Michigan, but rather each year they, they get pushed up from the south. So they overwinter down south where it's nice and war warm, so they're kind of like snowbirds, I guess. And they blow in in the spring or midsummer, um, and then they start to reproduce in our crops and become a problem. Um, they're sucking pests, so they suck plant juices out of the leaves. Um, they'll cause uh, modeling of, of raspberry leaves, and they can become a fairly serious problem. In high tunnels, our biggest concern is because we're providing a nice warm environment, um, is that we may actually be boosting the uh, population growth rate of the pest. Um, what we've done this year to manage them is we've tried a um, little experiment where we used a product called Pyganic, which is an OMRI approved or National Organic approved um, chrysanthemum based pesticide, so it's a natural pyrethrum. Um, we tried applying that. We also tried applying um, Mycotrol O, which is actually a mycopesticide or a biopesticide. It's composed of the fungus uh, Bavaria bassiana and we tried um, the two in combination. Um, we're still crunching the numbers, so I don't have much to report there. Um, another pesticide that's um, organic and labeled for potato leafhopper is in trust. Tunnels can actually also block out some pests, and so in some work that we did at the Southwest Michigan Research Center a few years ago, we found that Japanese beetles were much less of a pest problem in tunnel-grown raspberries than outside. So there are some benefits to growing um, raspberries in this protected environment as well. Japanese beetle is uh, an invasive um, pest in the United States. It was originally introduced into the United States in New Jersey back in the 1920s. Um, it's since spread um, westward and it's sort of making its way through Michigan. It's a serious concern for raspberries, for tree fruit, for cherries. Also it eats a lot of vegetables. Pretty much if it's a plant, Japanese beetle will eat it. Um, what makes Japanese beetle particularly hard to deal with is its life cycle. It only has one generation per year, but the larvae develop in the soil, whereas the adults are highly mobile and fly around. What this means is, is you can do a very good job of managing Japanese beetle on your farm or your garden, but if your neighbors do a bad job, um, you're, you're kind of always faced with this advancing, invading wave of shiny metallic beetles. Um, as far as Japanese beetle goes, um, really, the only management we have from an organic standpoint is uh, Pyganic, which is again a chrysanthemum-based natural pyrethrum insecticide that's, that's OMRI approved. Um, what Pyganic really does is it, it knocks them off the plant. Our hope is, is that by providing protected culture, so a, a hoop house like this, is that we may actually keep some of them out. Um, we have been seeing them here at our, at our research site, but they're a really variable pest from year to year. Today I wanted to focus on spotted wing drosophila. This is an insect pest that has come from Asia and it was de detected in the United States for the first time about three years ago in California. And since then it's moved its way across the country and in the end of 2010 we found the first infestation of spotted wing drosophila in Michigan. So we were looking for it and we had traps out around this farm last year and found a few, just a few at the end of the summer into, into October. So this year we were really on, uh, on our lookout, on our guard for spotted wing drosophila. And so we've been monitoring it throughout this planting. And we use a simple monitoring trap. You can see the, the design here. It's just a, a plastic container with some uh, holes burned in with a little, uh, a little hot needle. And then we've got a yellow sticky trap inside which can catch the flies. 
And then the bait is an apple cider vinegar. This, this attracts the flies. They come in from the surroundings, fly into the hole, get caught on the sticky trap. A few of them fall into the liquid. Um, but then we come along each week and we check these to see if we have spotted wing drosophila. Uh, it takes a little bit of practice. You need to know what you're looking for. The male fly, as the name would suggest, has spots on the wing. Unfortunately, unfortunately the female doesn't. And so you have to have a bit more um, a bit more of a knowledge of what those look, look like and be able to look up close to see the female's distinguishing features. And if you're interested on, in that, Michigan State University has a website where you can see all the details of how to identify spotted wing drosophila. So this season we had an interesting experience where in, the, in August, we hadn't caught any spotted wing drosophilas through the summer, and yet in August we started to pick up some in the, in the surroundings. And then in September, just at the beginning of September, started to catch some here in the tunnels. And the people that were picking the fruit and, and then um, sorting that to look at post-harvest shelf life started to detect some infestation. And so this is something to be aware of, that it can be quite a quick change from catching the first flies to potentially finding larvae uh, in, the, in the berries. Our observations, at least in this tunnel this summer, were, would be that we, we didn't find the infestation in the fruit so much up in the, the good fruit that are up, up in the top of the canopy where uh, people are picking more often and there's probably better cleanup of the fruit. It was more, it was more on, the, on the, the canes that will, uh, will flop down where they, get, they end up down near the ground and the fruit's covered by the leaves and if there was any chemical control going on it's less likely to have coverage down there so it's something to keep in mind if you do run into this pest that perhaps uh, some kind of clipping off of these or just making sure that your pickers are paying attention to the low fruit is something really worth uh, worth considering but it's interesting how this played out because we ended up with um, with that concern about the fruit and so the horticulturists in here went through and took all the ripe fruit off, took, took away all of the host material that the fly might have been able to survive in, and uh, got rid of that. They dumped that and uh, sealed it so it wouldn't just create more flies that would fly back in here, sealed it in some plastic, big plastic bags. And then they came in with a, a crop protection program that included the organic insecticide called Entrust. And that, so far this fall, a uh, combination of Entrust and then following that with Pyganic, which is an organic pyrethrum, that seems to have worked very well to keep these fruit free of spotted wing drosophila. We are still catching a few flies in the traps, uh, but at least so far the fruit are in good shape and are able to be sold and marketed. So we'll have some research data that we generate from this through the winter, but at least from the observations this first summer, we're starting to learn a little bit about the practicalities of growing high tunnel raspberries in this new era of spotted wing drosophila in this, in this region. There's a fairly simple method for sampling that I'll, I'll just show here, where you can pick a certain number of fruit. In our case, we were picking 100 berries um, in a row, going down the row and, and looking at fruit that we thought were really super ripe, which would be the ones that would be most likely to have the, the drosophila in them. And then we put those fruit in a bag with a salt solution. And this is a simple recipe of a, of a, a tablespoon of uh, salt in every quart of, of water. You mix that up, put it in the, in the bag with the fruit. And then you hold that fruit for, a, I think it's best to hold it for about half an hour or an hour. And if the larvae are in there, the Drosophila larvae, they will crawl out and you'll see them in the liquid floating around. So it makes a bit of a nasty raspberry soup but um, it's a quick way to just sort. You can look with the light through there and look, look and just shake it up and you'll see those, those small, they're, they're three or four or five millimeters long larvae floating around inside the, inside the um, container. Another aspect of our entomological research we're doing here in the organic tunnels with raspberries is to look at pollination. Uh, you can look here and see uh, a shoot that has some flowers still on it and here we are in the second week of October and in the high tunnels, we still have new flowers coming on. Whether there's enough time for these to turn into, uh, into these remains to be seen this fall, but we still see honeybees and bumblebees foraging in here on a nice warm day in the, in the beginning of October. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the work we're doing on pollination because 
It's so essential with this really high density of flowers that you get in a high tunnel to make sure you're getting enough pollination. And so this year we've been starting to look at this by comparing the level of fruit set and the level of uh, berry size that we get in, um, in flower, from flowers that are opening at certain times of the year and then we follow these through until they turn into berries. And by looking at the, the comparison between the flowers and the, and the fruit, we can look at fruit set, i.e. what proportion of flowers turn into fruit, and then at the, the size and, and the quality of the, of the berries. This work's also been done in a, in a comparison between the situation in high tunnels, and then we've been working at some commercial raspberry farms outside where those, those uh, bushes are open to the environment and to honeybees that are, that are stocked by the growers to look at that comparison. Um, data aren't in yet, so we're, we're not sure quite what to say about the results yet, but that's an area that we're focusing on because, as I said, this density of flowers in here during the summer and fall is so high. And we can also get conditions where the, the outdoor environment is not ideal for pollinators. And so uh, we may not have a high, dense, high abundance of pollinators around if we didn't supplement things inside the tunnel. And so what the horticulturists have done to, to do this, and I think this is a standard practice for high tunnel production, is to bring in some boxes of bumblebees. You can actually call a company, you can call them up and say, I'd like a certain number of bumblebee colonies on a particular date, and they will ship those to you. We've used a company called Coppert, based in Michigan, and, and they've provided these colonies that are then spread through the tunnel. We raise them up off the ground so they're not likely to be attacked by ants, uh, put them on a block or put them up um, on a wooden structure. We've seen growers that have done that as well. And those colonies are then opened up and the colony of maybe 200 workers plus one queen inside there then busily forages every day to get out and get the, the nectar and pollen resources that they need to grow their colony. One of the reasons we like bumblebees is because they perform really well under plastic and they're used in greenhouses as well and do well under glass. They're not so concerned about the uh, access to UV light or polarized light that honeybees are. And there's some possibility that honeybees are less likely to forage inside the tunnel than, than outside. So we bring the bumblebee colonies in. They're happy indoors. I've even seen them foraging on days in the spring where it's really cold outside. But in the tunnel, in the protected environment, they'll, they'll remain active. And they move from flower to flower. And because they're so covered in hairs, they will actually um, deposit more pollen per visit on a, on a flower and that's more likely to turn that, those, those small uh, um, stigmas into, into subsequent um, droplets on the, on the raspberry. We also see some native bees that come in um, that are not managed, we didn't bring those in, but they live in the environment around the tunnel and when the sides are up and there's access to the inside of the of the, of the tunnel and in, to come in on the, on the flowers. We sometimes see um, some small bees, many of them are ground nesting bees that live in the environment and just come in to visit the flowers, get the resources they need, which is mostly pollen, so they're moving a lot of pollen around and helping pollinate the flowers, and then they, they head out again. So with a combination of honeybees that, that could be uh, stocked in the environment, although you wouldn't want to put them in the tunnel, bumblebees that you can bring and purchase uh, in a box and then bring them into the tunnel and they'll do fine indoors. And then these native bees that might come from the surrounding landscape. Uh, with enough of those you can get really good fruit set and really good berry quality all the way into the fall when the last, uh, when the last berries are produced.